Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And aren't you thankful that God has preserved his word for us even in this day, 2018, when so long ago the, the apostles recorded these accounts for us? The great men of God recorded throughout the Old Testament these accounts for us, and we can look back on them and we can learn from them and pattern our lives so that we can be found faithful unto the Lord Jesus whom we desire to serve with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Hallelujah, friends. What a great gift God has given us, his people, his holy word. Now, if I sound a little funny this morning, let me apologize because I'm fighting a little bit of a head cold. But I am so thankful that I'm not suffering the misery that many throughout this nation are suffering due to the flu that's being spread and so many are suffering from well, we're continuing our study in the book of Ephesians, and today we're going to begin with chapter 4. But before we do, there's just a couple of things I want to point out. Now, I sincerely hope that you are watching these strange fire videos that I'm putting on the website. And I believe that there are 18 or 19 of these videos that we're going to watch together. Now, I'm currently on video 17, I think. And so for the last two days, I have been watching these back to back. Now, I watched them when they first came out in 2013, but certainly a reminder is good. But I also want to be fresh in case you have any questions or comments about what you see on the videos. And the one that I placed yesterday was actually video number 15, I think. But I felt it was so important in laying a foundation of what it is that's being addressed. And Steve Lawson does such a wonderful job in explaining sola scriptura. That the word of God is our final authority. That everything that we see and experience in this life, everything that we told has to be measured according to the word of God. And in my opinion, based upon all of the videos that I've watched so far, that is the most critical and the most important. And I've actually watched it three times in a row because he does such a great job in helping us to understand the importance of Holy Scripture. And the men and women that have gone before us and even died so that we can have this Bible in our hands today. Now, I have said many times in the past that we're not focused on the intellectual aspect of what we read and study from the Bible. We're focused on the practice and I feel that needs a little bit of explanation because certainly the Bible is a book of information, meaning that when we take it in, it goes into our minds. So there is an intellectual concept to the Bible. But what I mean is we're not focused upon dates and times and places that really lead to much arguments and do nothing for our practical daily living Christian practice. But certainly the Bible is an intellectual book. We're told to reprogram our minds, to fill our minds with the things of God, to meditate upon Scripture. But in doing so, we focus on the practical aspect of Scripture, how we are to live out what we are learning, as opposed to the facts of what we're learning. And more emphasis should be put on the practice as opposed to the facts. The second thing I want to point out is what Dr. MacArthur does such an eloquent job in pointing out himself is that one can be saved, one can be a true born-again Christian, and yet be misled. But it's only going to be for a season because there's something in that person that tells them that, that something just isn't right. And he says this implying that there are many that are involved in some of the things that we're going to learn about through this strange fire conference and they're being misled because two reasons one they're not being properly discipled and two they are young in their faith and they place their trust in others around them and even though they may be taking on some of these practices that they see taking place especially if they're involved in like a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church 
And pressure is being applied that the only way that they can be filled with the Spirit, for instance, is to speak in tongues, even though they may be participating. As they look around them and they see the things going on around them, there's something in their heart that just isn't settled. It's bringing more confusion than clarity. They have more questions than answers. And if you've experienced that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so for a season, they may be misled. But the Holy Spirit who lives within them is going to guide them into all truth. They're going to discover the truth. And they're going to leave those fleshly manipulative practices behind and delve deeper into the Word of God and become the men and women of God that Holy Scripture so calls them to be. And I say this because... I'm not speaking from a lack of experience. I attended a Pentecostal church very early on in my Christian practice, in my Christian life, in my walk with Jesus. And I remember the pressure that was put upon me to speak in tongues. And one of the things that I was told is whatever comes in your mind, speak it. And being young in the faith and want, wanting to be obedient, accepted, and all that I could be for Jesus... I listened to what they said. The problem was I didn't stop and think about it because if you stop and think about it, what would be in my head is what I hear others practicing. And that's why you can go to one Pentecostal church and you'll hear everyone speaking in tongues and they all sound the same. But you go to a different Pentecostal church, they sound different than the previous Pentecostal church, but everyone in that Pentecostal church all sound the same. And so I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit that I was so gullible. And yet, as we're learning in this Strange Fire Conference, there are millions that are just as gullible. And the reason that they're gullible is they're not standing up on Scripture alone. They're not reading their Bibles, and they're not allowing the Bible to be the rule. Instead, they're compromising the Bible, and they're allowing what's taking place around them to be the rule. And this is true, for instance, in tongues. This is true in paying tithes because the New Testament says nothing of paying tithes. Now, Jesus did say, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, give unto God what is God's, and we certainly are to give back to God. But there's no required amount. We're told to give cheerfully what brings pleasure to our heart, not something that's going to cause strain or stress. This could also be true with women pastors. The Bible is very clear in the book of Timothy that a woman is never to usurp authority over a man. Yet how many women have placed themselves in pastoral positions directly contradicting the word of God? And there are so many other issues, practices that are taking place within the Christian church today or the so-called Christian church today And yet when we measure them according to the word of God, we see that they're in contradiction. And so the purpose of these strange fire conferences and videos that we're placing on our website is so that you will understand the importance of keeping the Bible first, even if the whole world is against you. Stand upon the word of God. Stand for the truth of God. And do not allow yourself to be manipulated by others in compromising the Word of God. Well, having said that, let's uh, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's begin in our time together today in verse 1. Now, Paul says, I, therefore, because of everything that I've told you, I am a prisoner of the Lord. Now, remember, Paul has told us that we are to follow his example. We are to walk through this life as Paul is walking through this life, Because Paul is following the example of Jesus, and he's walking through his life as Jesus walked through his. And yet Paul calls himself a prisoner of the Lord. Why? Because he is bound to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. He understands that the world is the enemy of God, therefore it is his enemy. And so he has shackled himself, made himself a prisoner so that he doesn't become lured by the temptations, the passions, the desires, the pleasures, the conveniences of this world in which we live. And so we too are to be prisoners of the Lord. We don't enjoy all the freedoms of this world that the people of this world enjoy. 
And that's why he says, I'm begging that you will do the same. You will walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So we are to walk worthy in the position that we've been given. And the position that we've been given is prisoners. We're not let loose upon this world to suck it dry and enjoy every pleasure that it has to offer. We're prisoners of the Lord. And so we discipline ourselves not to follow our emotions. Instead, we walk with lowliness. We realize that we are a servant to all we come in contact with. And just as a servant would serve his master in his household, so we are to serve others with the same lowliness in all areas and at all times of our lives. And we do this by being meek. We're not proud. We're not arrogant. We're not boastful. We realize that we are here to serve just as Jesus came to this earth to serve. And this will require much patience or long suffering. And it will require us to forbear one another in love, which simply means we're to put up with one another. And this is especially hard when you become more mature in Christ and you're around those who take on adolescent qualities or characteristics I mean, think about it for a moment. Take a 70-year-old man and put him in a daycare center. That is going to drive him mad because he's a 70-year-old man. And he doesn't have the time, the energy, or the focus to be able to handle all the spontaneity, all the energy, all the excitement that those young ones are throwing at him all at once. And so too it is with us. When we're around those who are younger in Christ, we become impatient with them, expecting them to grow into something that took us years, and yet we want them to get it overnight. But if we simply think about it, we know that's not going to happen. So we're being encouraged here, exhorted here, to forbear one another in love, remembering that you too at one time, I too at one time, was just like them. And the purpose of this is so that we will keep the unity, the oneness of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body, there is one fellowship, there is one group of believers, there is one Spirit that controls us, that directs us, that guides us, that teaches us. There is one Lord, Jesus, King of Kings. There is one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And even though the younger ones are limited in the way that they see him, whereas those who are mature see him in a fuller picture, just remind yourself, as frustrating as those younger ones may be to you, you are just as frustrating to those who are older than you. And yet they're forbearing you in love. They're tolerating you. They're striving to help you with patience, care, and understanding. And so must we with the younger ones that we work with. For unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And so you could almost picture it like this. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the light of the world. But his light shines differently in each of us. Some are a 9-watt battery. Some are 14. Some are 50. Some are 100. Some are 1,000. But each of us are to walk in the light that we have been given. And the longer we walk with the Lord Jesus, the more obedient we are unto him and his teachings, the the brighter that light will become. But we're not going to go from a 9-watt battery to a 1,000-watt battery in a matter of days, weeks, months, or possibly even years. It's going to take a lot of experience, a lot of failures, a lot of mistakes, and a lot of successes in order for us to gain the wisdom so that we can mature in the Lord Jesus and we can become the faithful followers that he's called us to be. Well, we're going to close there today, friends, and I'm so grateful again that you're with us, and I'm so grateful and humbled to be able to bring you the living, powerful, authoritative Word of God. It's my greatest honor and my highest joy. I know what it's doing in me, 
And I pray every day for each of you that it's having its work within your life and that you are becoming more faithful, more joyful, more heavenly minded, and that your journey through this life with the Lord Jesus is not one of fret and dismay, but you are walking through this life in your journey with a song on your heart, praise upon your lips, awaiting and expecting the wonderful day when our Lord Jesus will return and take us home where we will live eternally with him and sing his praises forever. Hallelujah. Well, friends, may your day be blessed today. May your hunger and thirst for his word deepen. And in all you do, may you bring him much glory, honor, and praise. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.